almost finished. Democratic style. The democratic approach leads to collaborative and collective decision making. Blanchard notes that democratic leaders fully realize why God gives the resilient leaders two heirs and one tongue. They are invariably attentive listeners and meet with less backlash and rejection. This approach enables the leader to get people's ideas. It builds rapport, respect, and commitment. It fosters flexibility and responsibility. It also helps the leader to hear the screeching wheels and learn how to keep morale high and set realistic goals. The major drawback of the democratic style is that it can involve too many meetings and at time makes consensus elusive. It can lead to confusion, the feeling of inept leadership, and sometimes to conflict resulting from diversity of opinion in the workplace. The democratic style works best when leaders are uncertain as to which direction to take. It works well in generating new ideas, but it is less effective when employees are not well informed or competent enough to make worthwhile decisions. And you know, okay, all of this is also relates to the film industry, right? That's why, we, that's why I'm doing this, television and film. Okay. Pace setting style. The pace setting style is somewhat akin to the coercive style and should be used with caution because it can destroy the tone of an institution. The leader tends to be seen as a slave driver and seems to have little or no regard for the individuality amongst the workers. Leaders seem to be concerned only with exemplary high standards. The leader's objective is always to do things better and faster. He or she is quick to replace people who do not strive towards his or her standards. Such leadership can lead workers to become overwhelmed, thereby destroying morale. Pace setters expect people to know what to do in order to excel. They often feel that the worker is a poor fit if he or she has to be told what to do. Flex, and then working for a pace setter invariably becomes a task of second guessing the leader. Flexibility and responsibility are stifled and work becomes routine and boring. The pace setter tends to give no feedback and often takes over assigned jobs. He or she considers nothing is ever well done. Despite these flaws, this style works well. When all workers are highly competent, motivated, skilled, and need little direction or coordination. Under these circumstances, work is done on or ahead of schedule, but as with all other styles, it should never be used in isolation. What does it mean by that? Never should be used in isolation. So, yeah, you combine it with other styles, right? right? Anybody remember one of the styles? Let's review. What is one of the styles that we covered? Coercive. Coercive. Second one? Affiliative. Affiliative. Mm -hmm. Third one? Democratic. Democratic. What's another one? Um, authoritative. 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 Coaching. The last one. Did we say six? There it is. That's the last one. And, the, and according to these studies, the worst ones are the first one and this one. The pay setter. Oh, I didn't do coaching stuff. But I did mention it. All right, here it is. Let's look at it. Leaders who practice a coaching style help workers to become cognizant of their strengths and shortcomings. Coaching helps make the connection between workers and their career goals. Leaders also help workers to plan their long-term goals, set them challenging tasks, and give constant feedback to improve performance and achievement of set goals. You, you would like this kind of leadership in your advisor, right? If your advisor was this, like this. They are experts in delegating tasks. The coaching style is the least used leadership style. It is usually argued that the coaching style requires too much time in a high pressure work environment. What does that mean? Am I the type of advisor that's gonna spend quality time with you to go through a dialogue to see what your interests are, what you wanna become, right? 
That's why we show what we get paid for, right? Mm -hmm. That's why we teach and advise to build careers. So, but what the this is saying is that you could be at a job where it's <coughs> things are moving heck of scuff for facts. You got to make decisions fast. It could be manufacturing plant. You don't have time to back up and coach people. If anything, you you buy a machine on the assembly line to make your parts, right? You don't need people anymore, right? Automation. Furthermore, however, experience has shown that with this style, the first session is the most time consuming. So is that like a get into no session, the first one? Who are you? What are your interests? Furthermore, the time spent on coaching and teaching colleagues can pay high dividends in terms of climate and performance. The coaching style works well when people are aware of their weaknesses and want to improve their performance. The coaching style fails when workers are not interested in improving their performances or changing their ways. Again, this style does not work well when leaders lack the expertise to help their followers to move along. So one of the things, some of the things that leaders have change, they lead, they empower people, they inspire people, and they share vision. Okay, here's Martin Luther King. While some leaders may argue that it would be overwhelming to combine the six styles of leadership, others may even claim that they use only two of the styles. Nevertheless, leaders can either be coached into developing the other four styles, or they can build leadership teams using other people with different leadership styles to complement their repertoire of styles. The idea is that in the day-to-day -day work environment, the need may arise from the use of anyone or a combination of the leadership styles discussed. SNR, century-old institution with, with its Ursuline tradition, personifies those leadership qualities, leadership that seems to bestow credence, in the words of Shakespeare, Hamlet. This above all, to thy own self be true. And it must follow as the night the day thou cast not then be false to any man. Yes. In this discussion, we were engaged in a comprehensive analysis and evaluation of the merits and the merits of the leadership styles in both. We are convinced that leaders should always bear in mind a simple truism that one can only be an effective leader if one has dedicated followers. Right or wrong? Yes. The available data demonstrates that research outcomes of both the classical and the behavioral management theorists are the bedrock of effective leadership. However, empirical data suggests that a leader's honesty, integrity, and humility constitute the core of resilient leadership. The conclusion is that leadership is also a function of the followers' perception of their leader, more especially in the learning environment where actions speak louder than words, and people learn more from a leader's actions than his or her words. Ambivalence is not an option in resilient leadership. You know what ambivalent means, right? Indecisive. You can't have it both ways. You gotta be assertive. You can't have it both ways. True resilient leaders always have to walk and talk. For there can be no dichotomy between words and actions. Furthermore, effective leaders must always be able to overcome challenges or obstacles that are inimical to the mission of the institution. In closing, resilient, effective leaders share much humility and integrity in common with Socrates, who declared that the one respect in which he is wiser than other men was his keen appreciation of his own ignorance of the most important matters. That's Dr. King speaking. I thank you. Uh, can it get any worse than this? The professor actually believes I'm listening to him. So much is going on. 
as I look around, everyone else appears to be doing well. And here I am, sitting here in this classroom with the professor just bumping his gums. I want to be here, but I'm not. I'm only here physically because my mind is everywhere else in all of my situations. A homeless student, 25 years old, not a roof over my head, don't know where my next meal is coming from. Just lost my job last week, tuition running out. My girlfriend called and told me that her friend has not come. She thinks I ought to be happy. Then maybe I'd be a good daddy. Every now and then I'm able to get a meal at mom's, but she still has so little for herself. Being in a senior citizen building, I can't even lay my head there. Homeless I am. Homeless here I am. In this classroom, trying to get my degree. Don't even know how I'm going to pay for it. More importantly, will this degree give me everything that I am desiring? Will it put a roof over my head? Will it put clothes on my back? Will it put food on my table? Will it allow me to be a good father? How in the world can I take care of a baby when I can't even take care of myself? But I, I, I am an opportunity to get in outside from the elements, homeless. Now this is my home for this time. It is a safe and warm place, a place that I can at least look like I'm somebody with a desire to do something when I have nothing. I'm going to get my degree. But once again, I need to know, will it solve all of my problems? Only God is.